You already know what it is. It's your boy Laid Back with another reaction, another review, another episode. Hey, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, you up to bat. Bah! It's your boy Laid Back. Welcome back to my channel. Hey, two things we got to do. You got to hit that subscribe button. I'm drinking this water, man. You already know what it is. Elevate more in 2024. Elevate more in 2024. All right, now check this out. We back with another reaction. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the notification bell. Stay up to date with all the videos. We got Jordan Peterson. You know, that's my guy. And Ben Shapiro. You know, that's my guy now. You know, shout out to Ben, man. You know what I mean? He did a reaction to me as well. Uh, so I wanted to check out and see what Ben Shapiro be talking about. I was reading some of the comments about what y'all was telling me about him and who he is, what he stand for. And I see he got a video with my guy Jordan Peterson and they talking about Christianity and Judaism. I was like, what better way for me to get acquainted with Ben Shapiro than him sitting down with my guy Jordan Peterson? So let's see what they talking about. Y'all let me know in the comments too if I should check out more and what other stuff should I check out from Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson as well. But let's go ahead and get it. Fire Squad was popping. Let's get it. This is where I think we could have an interesting conversation about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. So there's an idea in Christianity, which is, I think, the central idea, which is that you need to face the potential for malevolence that exists within you and in the world. So that's Christ's mm. confrontation with the devil in the desert, with Satan in the desert. You have to come to terms with that malevolence. That's mm. part of existence. And you have to voluntarily accept the burden of suffering. And so that's the acceptance mm. of the cross. Okay, so you take on that, you say the suffering, so there's an idea that Christ is a messianic figure because... See, look, he go in on a different level because his, his, I feel like Jordan Peterson operate on a whole different other wavelength. How he break down stuff is one of the things that I like about him the most, how he just break down to the simplest. But anyway, let's just see what he's talking about. Okay, so you take on that, you say the suffering, so there's an idea that Christ is a messianic figure because he took the suffering of the world onto himself. Mm -hmm. And what that means to me is that he was someone speaking um, conceptually who decided that the suffering of the world was his responsibility mm -hmm. and right. that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed Ooh. to decide that that's your responsibility. You take that on a bur as a burden. You do the mm. same with the malevolence. So when you read history, you read history as a perpetrator, right? Maybe you also read it as a victim, but you certainly read it as a perpetrator. And then that's on you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the question is, what happens when you do that? And I would say the answer is two things, is that, first of all, it starts to force you to develop, like to mm. learn what you need to learn in the world and to absorb the information that would enable you to start to face the suffering and to rectify it. So that forces you to become a more competent person. And that's the socialization part that you thought of as so important. But then there's a secondary thing that happens too, which is that taking on that additional stress and demand voluntarily transforms you biologically because within your genetic structure let's say there's all sorts of potential but he said it transforms you biologically by just taking that on basically taking on the suffering like jesus took on the suffering how it transformed him on the cross and three days later he was risen and you saw hey hey let's go jordan Taking on that additional stress and demand voluntarily, voluntarily transforms you biologically because within your genetic structure, let's say, there's all sorts of potential, mm -hmm. but that won't be unlocked unless you place yourself in a position where the demands necessitate it. And so by... There's all type of stuff in there that could be unlocked, but won't get brought to the forefront until certain things are taken certain actions are taken for those things to be unlocked and for you to see the full potential in that. Let's go. Because within your genetic structure, let's say, there's all sorts of potential, but that won't be unlocked unless you place yourself in a position where the demands necessitate it. And so mm. by following that pathway, truth, let's say, the acceptance of suffering and the confrontation with malevolence, so that's mm. the heaviest load that you could take on, then you actually produce a psychophysiological slash spiritual transformation in yourself that matures you into like the representation of the father on earth that's mm. why that 
that's how that lays so, itself. Okay, so out. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad he got us here because the question that I said to you, I, there was only one thing I said to you guys before yeah, we yeah. started that I wanted to get to something about most of the lectures that you when we're doing these things, you're usually talking about the Old Testament. Now, obviously, mm. you're an Old Testament guy. I'm on But my my question was, do you think that Ben? Or, or just people that believe in the Old Testament exclusively are mm. missing something. So you just laid out a case of something that potentially... Of course. If you only believe it in the Old Testament exclusively, meaning that's the only thing that you believe in, according to the Bible, you're missing out on the whole New Testament, which is Jesus and all that type of stuff and the grace and all that. It's a whole dynamic shift when it comes to the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye type thing. New Testament is grace. Turn the other cheek. So it's a, it's a lot that's different. And it's a lot that's the same, too. Essentially is missing so there. Do you think that argue. is a I'm fair argue. argument? Well, what I'm going to argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian in the sense Ooh. that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus. And the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians. Isn't Christian to be Christ-like? I'm just asking for the people in the room in the back. I don't have a side in this. I'm just listening to them objectively both. But isn't to be a Christian is to be Christ-like? Let me know in the comments. A I'm fair argue, argument. Well, what I'm going to argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian in the sense that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus. And the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians, is that we are fundamentally incapable of taking on our own sin. And so we have to mm. have somebody who comes in the form of Christ on earth in order to accept that suffering for us. That's real. That, that is the purpose of God actually embodying himself in Christ, is to provide human beings the capacity to withdraw from original sin, that we don't actually have the capacity mm. beyond a certain mm. point to overcome. And that's why Jesus as a singular figure is necessary. I actually agree from a Judaic point of view with everything that you say, because for me, it's about accepting responsibility for my own sins on myself. And I don't have the ability to say that there is the, the suffering servant, the suffering Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself to relieve me of my sins mm -hmm. and therefore mm. give me a fair mm. shot at life. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so, okay, that's a, that's a really good objection, I think. And I think that there's a fair bit of confusion about that in the Christian community, for example. Mm. So I would say that that perspective is more explicitly Protestant. And then, then I would put the Catholics next to that, but then I would put the Orthodox types fairly far away from that, which is why so many Orthodox Christians, I think, have been interested in what I'm saying, because mm. their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because mm -hmm. like, I'm not an expert, I'm, you know, in the, in the doctrinal... And this is what I like about Jordan Peterson, too. He's honest. Like he said, hey, around this topic is when I start to fade on my knowledge on this, and he's he keeping it 100. That's one of the things I like about him. He don't try to be something that he not. He don't try to talk about things that he don't really necessarily know about. And, and if so, he'll let you know, I ain't too keen on this topic. What I'm saying, because their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because mm -hmm. like, I'm not an expert on, you know, in the, in the doctrinal differences. Right. Um, their sense is that it's the imitation that's of primary importance. Now, it's, it's a weird thing, because even in classical Christianity, you have, let, let's say, Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that, well, Christ died to save us all from our sins, and so we're already redeemed. But mm. that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly mm -hmm. enough, because you'd think it should. So there's this wow. paradox. And I think it's, I, I think part of the reason for that, this is, this is an extraordinarily complicated thing, but in, in, in the Brothers Karamazov, Christ comes back to earth. Right. And... Um, in Seville during the Spanish Inquisition and so he's doing his miracles and raising people <coughs> from the dead and like being all messianic and right. the first thing that happens is the Inquisitor arrests him, right. throws him in prison and then comes to visit him and basically says look um, the last thing we need after <laughs> setting up this church for 2,000 years is you. You're mm -hmm. a lot of trouble. You've put a moral burden on human beings that's too much for them to bear. Mm. And so what we've done is watered it down and put some intermediaries in place so that the moral demand that your example required mm. doesn't just crush people into nothingness, right? Wow. So every ideal Meaning that people can't be like you, according to what he's saying. The burden is so heavy that it weighs on them and their morale. Because they, it's, it's almost impossible to live 
the way that you set forth as a human. That's what I'm getting from that. Media is in place so that the moral demand that your example required doesn't just crush people into nothingness, right? So every ideal is a judge. Right. So then you have the ultimate ideal. That's the ultimate judge. And mm. from the inquisitor's point of view, that judge was too much. It was mm. too right. demanding. And so I think there's an, and so, so anyway, so mm. the inquisitor goes through all this argument and says, we're going to have to, you know, get rid of you again because right. you're, you're just too much to bear. Mm -hmm. And so Christ listens and doesn't, says any, doesn't say anything. And then just when the inquisitor stands to leave, Christ kisses him on the lips and he, the inquisitor mm -hmm. turns white in shock and then leaves, but he leaves the door open. And that's the brilliant, uh, that's the brilliant ending of, of Dostoevsky's piece. The Grand Inquisitor, and, yeah. Yeah, and it, what makes him such a genius, because he basically mm. says something like, well, look, the, the Catholic Church did reduce the burden, and it is corrupt in the way that earthly organizations are likely to be corrupt. Mm. And it does allow an out, which is, well, you can put your sins on Christ, let's say, and that alleviates mm. your moral burden, but it still keeps the damn door open. Well, this and is... So th this is why I think it's really fascinating, having, having spent a lot of time with Christian theologians in the past couple of years writing this book, is that the, the original conceit, I think, when, when, when you talk with people who are Christian and Jewish and you have sort of interfaith conversations, uh, the original one-sentence conceit and the difference between them is that what you hear from Jews is Judaism is acts-based and Christianity is faith-based. Mm. Christianity is about the acceptance of Christ. When you accept Christ, then right. you've accepted what you need to accept and everything flows therefrom. Mm -hmm. And Judaism says it's not just about accepting God, it's all these mitzvot, right? There are all these commandments that you have to do, and these are what perfect. I mean, what they say, faith without works is dead. So is that like combining both? Because he said one is more so faith-based, the other one is more so act-based. But it's also scripture that say faith without works is dead. That scripture combines both. Y'all let me know in the comments, man. I'm just saying. When you accept Christ, then you've accepted what you need to accept and everything flows therefrom. Mm -hmm. And Judaism says it's not just about accepting God, it's right. all these mitzvot, right? There are all these commandments that you have to do, and these are what perfect you as a human being. It's, it's the performance of these commandments, accepting God's sovereignty because he's the one who gave the commandments, but mm -hmm. you actually have to act in the world. And if you don't mm -hmm. act in the world, then you haven't fulfilled your responsibility in the world. Right. This could also be an argument why you could have, although I know you wouldn't be thrilled with yeah. them per se. You and it's another scripture that talk about they confess with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. Meaning that, okay, they say one thing, but their hearts dictate their actions and their actions are completely different than what their mouths say. So it is scripture that talk about that. You just can't walk with faith. You got to have works. You got to have acts. You got to have a standard that you live by as well. But let's listen. You actually have to act in the world. And if you don't mm -hmm. act in the world, then you haven't fulfilled your responsibility in the world. Right. This could also be an argument why you could have, although I know you wouldn't be thrilled with yeah. them per se, you could have Jewish atheists in that they believe that it's just mm. their actions here. Yes, 100%. Wow. So, so th this is why you know Jews have had very, and, and I think most Christians believe this too, the idea of having a moral atheist is not really a difficult idea. Yeah. It's the idea of having a system built on atheism that's completely immoral and will fall apart almost immediately. And the idea of having a moral system built on atheism, if you examine your atheism closely enough, I think falls apart. I think that moral atheism is basically you separating your morality from your atheism and then ignoring your atheism in pursuit of the morality, which is, well, you can live mm -hmm. fine that way, that's fine, but I don't think that that's yeah. psychologically sustainable um, in, if you actually examine the core of your ideas. But with, with that said, I think that Christianity, after its original millenarian viewpoint, when, when Christianity first came about, the idea of Christ on earth was that he had ushered in the messianic era because this was it was it was a new era it was a right. new day and then it turns out that people looked around and went well this looks a lot like the old day right, right, not, right. not that much has changed mm -hmm. and so what changed what changed was our spiritual status that was the new redefinition of the messianic era is that the the what christ had brought to earth was a new spirit right he, he right. Brought, yep. brought a new spirit into the earth right. and he he cleansed people of their sins and given them a fresh shot at life basically right. yep. uh, and that in doing so he changed the nature of of how things work right well, judaism basically said well we never thought that that nature Nature change in the first place, right? That's 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 something different. And so, ironically enough, I think one of the sources of Christian anti-Semitism over time is an attempt to distinguish what makes Christianity different from Judaism, other than Christ. 
because mm. Christianity and Judaism, in most of their main philosophies, are similar. have an awful lot in common. It's right. interesting. I just interviewed um, a, uh, a fellow named John MacArthur, who's a major pastor, major Christian theologian. I interviewed him a couple of days ago. Maybe I'll check special. that out next. And this came up. I asked him, so where do you think the differences are between Christianity and Judaism? And he basically said, Jesus. Right, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the mostly honest answer because when I hear Christian theologians try to distinguish Judaism from Christianity, what they say about Judaism I find to be not accurate as to what Judaism actually says. And when I hear Jews try to distinguish Christianity from Judaism, I think that, well, and I'm not saying they're the same thing mm -hmm. because they're not, right. obviously, they're different belief systems, but in terms of the underlying value system, the reason that we say Judeo-Christian value system is because in terms of the value system itself, the commonalities of... are overwhelming. They're overwhelming that's what i just said that's what i just said it's a lot of similarities in that he's talking about faith base he's talking about x base and it's scripture that talk about both of those that kind of merge those together they're like siblings overwhelming the differences are mostly doctrinal and historical and in terms of what you think god i think that christians read back in an acts based version of their own lives through a variety of mechanisms, whether they say, well, predestination exists, but in order to show that if I were really elect, I would be acting this way, right? That is an acts based version. It's just retroactive mm -hmm. from the end. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why if you say to a Christian, so you really believe that you can lead a terribly dissolute, awful, terrible life, but if you believe in Christ with the full fiber of your being, you're going to heaven? And they'll so, say, well, the, well, and, and many of them will say, yes, but then you say, but what makes a good person? And they'll say, right, not, but if, uh, and right, what they'll always add, but if you believe in Christ, you wouldn't do all those things. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the. That was very, very interesting. I like that type of talk. It gets your gears churning, you know what I'm saying? It gets you gets you to think, you know what I mean? Y'all let me know if I should check out more of that. Ben in this interview said he had interviewed a, a pastor. Y'all let me know if I should check that out and see what he was talking about in regards to uh, what, what the pastor was saying, what what kind of like the conversations and that type of stuff. What 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 lanes and avenues they was going down. But I think that's very interesting, especially listening to these high level thinkers talk about these complicated, but yet simple, you know, topics about Christianity and Judaism and the similarities and the differences and how they can see how one is very similar to the other and certain th just small minor details can actually take you down different routes. So I like that. Y'all let me know in the comments what y'all think about this. Also, what's your thoughts on what's the difference between Christianity and Judaism? Old Testament, New Testament. But y'all let me know in the comments, man. Till next time, self-love and positivity. Make sure y'all hit that like button. Fire Squad, I got you and you know it. Hey.